online series that tells the story of China one object at a time. I'm Dinda Elliott, and I'm delighted today to have Miranda Brown, who is really one of the leading experts on the history of food in China. Uh, and she's also a professor of Chinese history at the University of Michigan. Um, and the object Miranda has chosen to talk about today is the dumpling, which as it turns out is not only an iconic and delicious Chinese mainstay, but also tells a profound geopolitical and cultural story. So Miranda, let's jump in. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, so, so we think of the dumpling as quintessentially Chinese. Um, I think we do. And so I'm wondering, is it, is it really, is, it, is the dumpling Chinese? Well, I mean, I guess it depends on what we mean by Chinese, but I, I would say that it, it, it probably didn't start out that way, which I think makes it a more interesting object. Um, the sort of the word, um, the earliest word for dumpling, um, which we start to see around the third century AD is um, a term that today means steamed bun, um, mantel. Um, and it is actually borrowed um, from a Turkic language um, into Chinese in the medieval period. Um, this term mantel today, you know, sort of roughly translates into something like barbarian head, but that's that's actually not really, it's, it's, there, it's just- Nice name, nice name. name. <laughs> yeah, that are, is, you know, it's just, it was a, it was basically a, a foreign word that had to be sort of like, you know, transliterated into a Chinese sort of um, format. And so they, they took sounds and, and, and when we see things that don't really make sense, it's usually a, a, a sort of a tip off that you're dealing with a foreign word. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that, you know, in sort of ancient and medieval China, there were a lot of uh, people that spoke a language related to Turkish. Um, who were you know, out in Northeast China, what is now the borderlands of Northeast China or in Central Asia. Um, it was Northwest China, right? Northwest, the North, they moved from the Northeast to the Northwest. Um, okay. And they started okay. historic migration. They, they eventually end up of course in Turkey in Anatolia. Aaron, let's look at the next, uh, the next slide. I think, oh, sorry. I think we want to look at the one from Turpan. If you can jump to that. Yeah, there we go, right? So that's what you're talking about. Right, and so the, you know, the, when we think of you know, sort of medieval Chinese history, really China between the third and let's say thirteenth century. I mean, there's some disagreements about dates. We're really dealing with a period where there's a lot of influence in China from the West, um, from Central Asia in particular. What I mean by the West, I don't mean Europe. I mean you know, Central Asia, uh, North, what is today Northwest China, places like Xinjiang Province. Um, and there you have, you know, people who are nomadic or semi-nomadic who are from the steppes, who um, have a, sort of a diet that has a lot of dairy and also a lot of um, wheat products like dairy. Uh, so Aaron, you wanna go back to the image of the Tang Dynasty, um, the Tang Dynasty fat ladies, I love this. So Miranda, is that, um, it, was it in the Tang Dynasty? That this is when it really started moving into China through the Silk Road or? or before that, I, I would say by the third century, we have a poem called the O2, like being, which is a reference to any kind of a dumpling or noodle, um, you know, pasta product. Um, and there it's, it's quite clear that at the elite level, wheat is not something that is an everyday food yet. Um, there's a lot of, there is basically what we would consider a very developed, you know, pasta culture. Um, so we think that that exchange probably happened earlier, maybe as early as the first century BC, probably a little bit later. But certainly by the early medieval period, the third century, China has a lot of sort of influences from Central Asia, um, you know, from people that live in what we think of as Western and Northeastern China, um, and mostly nomadic peoples who, you know, are often intermediaries between uh, different civilizations. Um, and so, you know, this is also a period where China's, North China is a step uh, because of uh, climate cooling. And so you see a lot of this kind of influence on the boundaries between what we think of as classic China and sort of the step is actually blurred. Um, and so you have things like polo, you have Buddhism, which is from the West, you have, you know, step culture, um, horse milk. I mean, these are all sort of part and parcel of this culture. Mm -hmm. of and, by, and by the Tang Dynasty, where these lovely fat ladies are having their delicious, some kind of lovely banquet, um, had dumplings been pretty much, uh, you know, regular, yet regularized in the Chinese cuisine? At least at the elite level, yes, at least for several centuries um, by then. Okay. At, at the very least, we're talking three, four, five centuries. Uh huh. And still, there continued to be lots of influences from the sort of Turkic world. 
Turkic world, from you know what we think of as the Proto-Mongol world, um, from the Persian world, like red wine is something that comes in in early medieval China, from what is now Western China, but was inhabited by people who spoke a language you know related to modern Persian. Mm -hmm. and, and once we let's moving forward to the Ming Dynasty. Once we get to the Ming Dynasty, what was what was going on at that point? So we've got an image here from one of the most famous um, paintings in Chinese history along the river during the Qingming Dynasty, during the Qingming Festival, and we've just got a tiny little uh, snip, you know, close-up shot of just a food shop. Um, but in terms of dumplings, what was going on with dumplings in the Ming Dynasty? Well, okay, so there's, I mean, a number of things. I don't think there are dumplings in this particular picture. If I were to guess, these are kind of <laughs> these rice cakes that you find all throughout Southeast Asia now. Um, but I think what we have is, well, first of all, the term changes meaning, right? So we're no longer calling, in most places in China, they're not calling them manto or something related to that. Um, they're calling it similar to something like jiao. So um, there are a few spots that reserve that are archaic naming. Um, um, so dumplings, of course, are adapted. Um, they really come to the south, which is the Shanghai region, from historic migrations from the north um, during nomadic invasions. Um, and then once the dumpling hits the south, it gets adapted to local tastes and, and, and according to the availability of local ingredients. So if you get to the Shanghai region, of course, you're gonna have a lot of seafood and shellfish in the dumplings. Um, mm -hmm. You're going to also have things like cheeses, which are very popular and were introduced, I think, from Northwest and in Northern China. And that's an amazing thing. You don't think of cheese as being something that's popular in Shanghai. Uh, well, you know, yes, but it's fascinating. So tell us about this cookbook, famous cookbook called The Health Building of the People. Um, I believe that's the name of it, written by Song Xu during the, during the Ming Dynasty. What was oh, that about? Uh, well, the, the cookbook is called, um, his is actually um, Mr. Song's um, sort of like instructions for, you know, sort of, I guess, um, promoting life or vitality. Okay. Um, it's a different name. Um, he's a, you know, an official that is from, actually a descendant of the Song Dynasty Imperial family that moved to the South during one of these invasions. Um, his uh, family was actually, you know, the most important sort of family in his district in the Shanghai region and produced some important poets. He was kind of a minor figure, but he put together his mom's favorite recipes for banquets. Um, and so it has a lot of dumpling recipes. Um, sometimes the dumplings are made with things like mutton fat, the sh you know, um, the, the shells or the skins or cheese. Made um, with, say that again, made with what? Mutton fat? Mutton fat. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can you can put anything in the dumpling skin or in pasta skin. Um, he also puts cheese into the dumpling skin. Um, he has baklava in his recipe book, um, which is you know very similar to things you find in Ottoman cookbooks. Uh -huh. Um, he's, uh, but he's crazy about crab, you know, this is, you know, so it's a very much a Shanghainese book. Um, uh -huh. and so put crab into some of his dumplings as well. Certainly. Yes. Wow. Okay. So, so that's, yeah, that's, sure. that's, <laughs> that's so interesting that, that, um, he, so, so that book, was it actually a, a quite an obscure book, which you historians then much later discovered, or did it become an important, you know, kind of like a Bible of cooking somehow? It's not a Bible of cooking in our classic sense, but it was considered to be important enough for the Qing rulers who ruled China from the 17th to the early 20th century to put it in their sort of canonical collection, in their four treasures collection. I um, see. And this is a rare thing for actually for cookbooks to make it to that kind of status. Um, right, 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 right. So then it did it in some ways kind of dictate or help guide um, the imperial, you know, imperial menus and imperial cuisine? Um, that is unclear. I mean, I know that the imperial menus are very, you know, have a lot of influences from the Shanghai region, you know, broadly speaking, because the, you know, the Qianlong Emperor who ruled in the 18th and, um, century was, you know, very fond of the food of that region. Um, so, you know, the question is whether this cookbook was a trendsetter or whether it was a really a reflection. Um, I, I would probably say that at the very least it's a reflection of the cooking styles in that region. Um, we find a lot of overlap between the recipes there and other cookbooks. Mm -hmm. Well, so I just have to mention that I, so I'm going to have to do a little more research because when I was doing very, you know, sort of minimal preparation, I was looking for Song Xu and I found a Song Dynasty painter named Song Xu, probably different characters, but the same pinion. And he actually, he was a painter, but he wrote a book called Health Building of the People. So, so I'm going to have to research that and figure out who he was and what that was all about. But so, so at what point did the dumpling take on what we consider to be the modern? form of the dumpling and 
you know, the ubiquity of what we have come to understand in its modern context. I love these beautiful dumplings that you made, Miranda. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I think most of it, the essential elements are there by the third century AD, you know, um, oh, so, I, mean, I mean, probably, I mean, but certainly we have recipes from the sixth century and that they, it looks the way we look, you know, in certain parts of China. Now, what ha happens, of course, is that depending on where you are in China, the dumplings gonna look quite different. So if you go over to the dumplings, um, I'm not these, these are the wheat dumplings that you find in Northern Chinese households. But if you like, for example, let's take this um, xia tiao, which is known as ha gao, um, or um, it's a shrimp yeah. dumpling that is a staple, you know, basically dim sum, right? Yeah. Now in the South, you're gonna have to adapt the recipe and change the skin because wheat is not, you know, super abundant, right? And so you're gonna find other ways of, you know, sort of, you know, sort of I think, conveying this concept with different ingredients. And so right. that I think, you know, it's gonna be a little bit later. We don't have exact dates because the, some parts of China are not really particularly well documented. Um, and so, so the further south you go, the later actually the sort of descriptions really sort of recipes for the, the food culture. Um, um, and so this is, I think one example, but this is, I think a modern dumpling that, you know, at least is several hundred years old. Um, wow. I mean, it's also now made with tapioca starch, which is an ingredient that, you know, really enters China at the end of Ming or probably Qing Dynasty. So probably 17. Look at this insane example on the left with gold dust and wasabi truffle. So that, I suppose, is a reflection of the rise of incredible wealth in China these days, like really contemporary. And people well, are this picture's from Mumbai. So this is like a- Oh, okay. So it's, okay, got it. So it, it probably, you, you would find things with truffle oil, certainly in gold dust in Hong Kong. I mean, I've, yes. I've seen fancy foie gras dumplings and those kinds yeah. of things. But so what I think is really interesting about this is the fact that you know, dumplings can be adapted, right? You can not right. only change the filling, but also the skin, yeah. depending on what's available and also what you need the dumpling to do for you here. Uh -huh. to show off some kind of wealth or cosmopolitan credentials or the creativity of the cook. So it's right. really a modular sort yeah. of creation. As opposed to the simple homemade dumpling, right. Uh, and that, to me, it begs the question, fascinating question about authenticity. What is authentic? And you've said that starting way back from, you know, from the third century on, the dumpling was adapted and changed and changed and changed again. And, you know, as foreign cultures come into China and et cetera. And, you know, there's lots of discussion today about uh, the experimentation that's going on with Chinese food, like even in America, is it okay? Is it authentic? And, you know, it suggests that maybe it's okay to be a little playful. Oh, I, you know, I think that that's essential, right? And that what makes this <laughs> food interesting, and I would say Chinese food interesting, actually, is that it really it reflects centuries of creativity, right? It's centuries of, of multiple sort of cultural and culinary influences, you know, a melting pot of influences. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so you mentioned something about China's sort of imagination of itself as a multi-ethnic state. Um, so what role does the dumpling play in that mythology? I mean, why is this important to understand? I'm not sure it plays that role in, in the current mytholo um, uh, mythology, but I, I think that, I don't even think it's a mythology. I think it's correct. I think, you know, like most empires, China has historically been a melting pot. That's, I think, the rule, not the exception for empires. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think, of, you know, the, the, the dumpling is a case study or sort of another piece of evidence that really supports this idea that there have been more than just people that we think of as classically Han Chinese, people whose ancestors came from the Yellow River, but that, you know, China is really a product of a lot of different groups, right? Some of whom today are considered, you know, minorities or outside of China, but they have had a really important role in sort of making Chinese food and Chinese history what it is. Wow. Okay, so a final question, because we're just about up to the 15 minute mark. Um, but why on earth are you writing a book about milk in China? I didn't expect to find it, right? And the, you know, there's nothing more fun than myth busting, and also, you know, learning to sort of see Chinese cuisine and Chinese history in, in a different way, um, and realizing that you know there are, are that, you know milk drinkers, you know, were really sort of essential to the development of what I think of as China as a cosmopolitan sort of empire, and, and, and I would say state. When did milk first come into China? Well, that's unclear, but definitely by the Han Dynasty. So first century AD, we have references to people drinking horse milk at port. Um, uh -huh. They borrowed from steppe peoples. They were very wow. Again, your view of, you know, the culture of history and, you know, cultural history is just so fascinating because it helps us 
have a deeper understanding about, you know, why China is the way it is today and where it all came from. So thank you so much for that. Um, unfortunately, our time is up, but we promised to bring Miranda back um, because we were planning lots of food, fun food programming this spring. And um, she's working on a fascinating project that I'm not going to tell you about today, but it's going to be a really fun thing that we're going <laughs> to hopefully present to you later this spring. Um, please check out our Pieces of China episodes on YouTube. And I really want to encourage you all to become members of China Institute. It's super cheap. It's just $75. Uh, you get great discounts on everything we do. But more importantly, your support helps us bring brilliant speakers like Miranda to you. Um, the next few Pieces of China episodes are going to be really fascinating as well. We've got America's one of America's top China curators talking about the Tang Dynasty's iconic Sansai glaze. Um, and for you designistas out there, we're going to have a brilliant interiors expert talking about a 17th century wallpaper that takes us back to the earliest days of China's trade with the West. Uh, so please stay tuned. And Miranda, above all, I just want to thank you so much for joining us and helping us tell the story of China. Thank you, Miranda. Well, thank you for inviting me.